start. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the data science learning community. We're talking about practical deep learning for coders. And today we're gonna walk through the uh, sixth video, I believe, uh, in, the, in the series. Uh, this one focused on building random forest models from scratch using the Titanic data set. Um, as we've noted in previous weeks, the, the material was a little bit all over the place. Uh, Torin, you presented last week. Uh, and, you know, towards the end of the fifth video, we started talking about decision trees. And I, I know you didn't really focus on that material. So, I kind of picked it up from where you stopped. So uh, I guess initially we'll we'll talk a little bit about decision trees before we move into the random forest. Uh, and then, you know, in, in this week, there was a, a second part really, which was like Jeremy just talking through how you uh, build models efficiently or how he kind of goes through the process and, there's apparently a whole series of videos <laughs> related to that. Um, given that the the sixth video in the series was already like close to two hours, I I didn't go through that extra step of uh, watching his his uh, multi part video series of of how he kind of develop models develops models for for Kaggle competitions. Um, and I didn't really focus on the book either, which which I believe pairs up with chapter nine uh, this week. How about you guys? I'm just curious how you attack the material heading into this week. I just watched the video. I was planning to read the book after what Andrew said last week, but I didn't get to it. Yeah, it, it's a lot. Like you could spend all week on this if you wanted to. Yeah. So you pick your battles. I did go through the book chapter, but that was actually last week. Um, I did. Or was it or the week? Whatever. There was another week that had part of chapter nine in it. I can't remember. It was no, probably lesson, last week, right? Had yeah, partial last week. chapter nine. So I read it then and actually went through the whole thing. And so I'm like, well, I've got this far. Um, I thought it was pretty useful. And I'm, but with you, I also only did up. I did the video. I paid attention mostly to the first part. I watched the rest of it, but I kind of like, you know, uh, almost like watching Olympic side in the background. <laughs> so like, I really paid that much attention to it. Uh, there may have been some nuggets in there. Um, yeah, yeah, and so I, really I guess the way particular the, to his methods and using fast kaggle and all this stuff. So I don't know. Yeah, he, he's highly opinionated. Yes, <laughs> there's this no is doubt about that. That's a great way to put it. So uh, the way I attacked the material is I, I kind of doing a, a code walkthrough for you know that that relates to the decision tree and and random forest material, and then I just noted. Uh, a lot of the opinions that <laughs> Jeremy talks yeah. about in the second part of the video. So maybe we can we can talk about that uh, okay. after we walk through the the code here. Okay. Uh, so you know the basic setup is we're working with the Titanic data set. Uh, I have it saved locally on my machine. Uh, Jeremy tends to process his data through functions, right? It's it's kind of an efficient way to go about things here. So. Uh, we we talked th through this, I believe, in an earlier lesson about filling in NAs with uh, some sort of value because you need that uh, to to run a lot of machine learning models. Uh, so here we're just uh, filling in the blanks with uh, the mode. Uh, we're taking the log of a fare, which is not really necessary uh, in this week because we're we're dealing with decision trees and it's the log transforms a monotonic transformation, but it doesn't necessarily hurt things. And then we're just transforming uh, the categorical variables uh, mm -hmm. using uh, using this categorical uh, function within pandas. Were, were you going to say something, Ron? No, sorry. No, I just made a noise. <laughs> oh, yes, that's what I said. Excuse me. <laughs> I make a lot of those. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, right. So Jeremy kind of goes into this thing about like, well, you can one hot encode uh, the categorical variables, or you can, he doesn't use this term, but what he's doing is label encoding. 
uh, the the categorical variables that are in there. Uh, and this really comes into play with, um, let's see, it's it's the embarked uh, uh, that has at least th it has three categories, right? C, Q, and, and S. Um, we could one hot encode this so that we have either two or three columns, right? Just of zeros and ones. But what he's demonstrating is you can just set an arbitrary integer associated with each of those categories. So instead of two or three columns, you only have one. Um, and so so it's, it's a bit simpler uh, given that you, you have fewer columns there. Um, it, Jeremy lists uh, his best practice, uh, which is I think if you have, what is it, four or more levels, you should probably go about things in the, uh, you know, label encoding manner as opposed to uh, the one hot encoding uh, method. I don't, I don't know if you guys have any uh, deep preferences there when you tackle, uh, you know, machine learning problems or when you're working with uh, decision trees. But uh, that's his position: is is you should probably uh, label encode when you have a lot of levels. Right, and the reason for that was, I'm trying to remember now. Oh, the, I guess the reason was if you only have a few labels, you one hot encoding doesn't hurt you that much. And then you get a little bit more efficiency in the tree, but with a lot of labels, then one hot encoding is going to cost you a lot in terms of columns, and it's better to pay the price in terms of having extra splittings. Is that a reasonable summary? Yeah. I, you know, he, he really didn't go into a lot of detail about that, so I did a... <laughs> A bit oh. of independent research on this, and I, I've run into this problem uh, myself. And there's a helpful article out there. I'll post it in the chat too, so cool. folks have this. Uh, random forest. Okay, coding. Uh, and and basically, uh, this article it, it's old. It came out in 2016. Uh, the authors compare kind of the default settings in scikit-learn, at least at that time, versus H2O, which is another uh, library uh, that exists for Python, R, and probably some other languages. Uh, and I guess H2O, uh, at default, if you're supplying it categorical variables, it will, it will treat, it will just do the label encoding behind the scenes, whereas I think that what they were making the case that scikit-learn by default uses uh, more of a one-hot encoding uh, environment. And in that article, they, they have a few points. It, basically, they're saying you'll probably get lower predictive performance if you have uh, a categorical feature that has a ton of levels, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis just, just the label encoding. And one of the key points they bring up is, you know, you, you have the sparsity issue. You know, let's let's say you have a, uh, category that has, I don't know, 50 levels, right? And it's going to be really hard for those individual decision trees to make a split based on just one level, um, given that that one level probably doesn't make comprise a significant percentage of, of your data and your training set. Uh, so, so the splits with categorical variables usually occur kind of later on in the in the in the in the tree as opposed to early on. Uh, even though, you know, a particular categorical variable might be extremely important uh, for prediction purposes. So, uh, you know, things just kind of get lost in the shuffle uh, when you one-hot encode. And uh, for whatever reason, the, the decision trees can make sense of things a little easier with that label encoding when you just have the arbitrary, you know, integers associated with the, the different different categories there. Hopefully I didn't lose folks there, if that, that makes sense, or if you've had any any similar issues there. No, that made a lot of sense to me. I'll, I'll definitely look at that article, though. What the heck is H2O? Uh, it's it's uh, a bit of a, I think it's an auto ML type package where you, know, you just uh -huh. have to do less work in getting the models to work. So um, I don't know if the tuning is, is happening automatically or you know just the, it's abstracted to a point where you can kind of just write one line of code and Fit a random forest uh, with some some best practices kind of baked in there. Gotcha. 
another issue when you one hot encode variables is if you're running a feature importance plot, uh, you run into the issue where the importance is calculated uh, for, e for each level of your categorical variables. So it gets really hard to figure out like, you know, is this variable important or not? Because uh, any get, given level of your your category may not be a you know a top five, top ten type variable. Um, and from what I understand, it's it's not as simple as just adding up your uh, individual feature importance scores together. It it really doesn't work that way. Um, so that's just another reason why you might want to label encode because you don't have that issue. And so when you're generating a feature importance plot. Uh, you know, you're 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 considering all of the the levels uh, together as opposed to separately. Interesting. That's actually really useful. I'm glad you went off and uh, found that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so because he just so gives that he just gives a half uh, offhand remark about it, and off we go. So that just, that's right. I really he gives his opinion this. without yeah. without diving diving yeah. deep into it. I really Absolutely. appreciate this. Uh, and I am an R guy, right? More than a Python uh, person. And I use the Ranger package, uh, usually when I'm fitting uh, random forests, mostly because it tends to be faster than other implementations. But uh, by default, if you're um, feeding that package a factor variable, it, it does do uh, label encoding. So uh, that's just something to to take into consideration. It, it can do one hot encoding if you change, I think, some of the arguments, but uh, you know, at, at default, it, it will do label encoding. And it tends to run a lot faster also uh, compared to uh, the one hot encoding. Does it do that for character as well or only factor? Because factor is already like labeled. Oh, that's a, that's a good, good, good point. Uh, I think it does the conversion for you. Okay. If I remember correctly, um, I, I don't, maybe you don't have to explicitly, you know, convert it to a factor, um, but, but it's very convenient. Like I said, the, the label encoding uh, always seems to work well with me. Oh, okay. So you actually have a, quite a bit of experience using these uh, type of models. I, yeah, random forest is, is <laughs> as Randy kind of, or Randy, as Jeremy noted uh, in, the, in the video, like it's his go-to uh, model, right, uh, for, for tabular data. And, and I'd say that's usually what I <laughs> okay, that's good to use uh, first as well uh, whenever I'm, I'm dealing with tabular data. Uh, you know, XGBoost tends to get better results, but not necessarily right out of the box. Uh, right, there's some tuning that needs to be done. Whereas with 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 random forest, there's very little that you need to do. Um, you can hyper hyper tune uh, a variety of, of parameters, but you know I have found that you typically don't get significant you know uh, lift in, in doing so. Like you get a pretty good result right away just at the the default settings. Yeah, I've only used it a few times. I'll be honest, ninety nine percent of what I do is like. Bayesian regression models. <laughs> it's like okay. pretty straightforward. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it I always call it the uh the Swiss Army knife of yeah. machine machine learning yeah. models. He makes a point I'm gonna start doing that more, uh, or not more, but start doing that in the future where I start out with the random forest model to help with the exploration. I think that was a solid point. Like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Start out with that so you can try to understand what your data looks like. And yep. Yep. A absolutely. And again, it, it tends to be fast. You don't have to do a lot of feature engineering. Uh, it, it just kind of works. All right, and and so I went down another <laughs> rabbit hole as well. I, I, don't, I don't know if you guys would enjoy this or not, but I, I it, because I was thinking about, okay, you can label encode, you can one hot encode. Uh, there are other popular techniques out there for categorical variables. I don't know if you folks have experience with this, but um, a really, popular thing to do with categorical variables. It's called um, target encoding. Sometimes it's called mean target encoding, um, where you know, in, instead of just coding the variables with ones and zeros or, or just random integers, you actually cheat a bit and look at your target variable 
and in the case of classification, like like we're dealing with here with the Titanic data set, you'd say, okay, for for this particular category, uh, let's say it's 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 class of the ticket, right? Like first class, what percentage of first class tickets actually survived? And so you would encode that percentage uh, every time you saw first class. Um, uh, in in your data, in your training data, right? Um, so, you know, that's I I think probably a top, you know, three top five things people do to, to improve their scores is is mean target encoding. Uh, the problem is again you are cheating by looking at the target. So there's some data leakage that that happens there. So there's a variety of techniques out there so that you minimize the data leakage. Um, and I have some some other articles uh, <laughs> about that. And um, I'll put that in the chat as well. So the idea is to turn yeah. your categorical into a number, right? To a numerical type column instead. That That's right. But it, it the what you're encoding is actually directly related to the, the target sure. you're looking yeah. at. A couple a uh, couple links for you there. Uh, the, the first one, it basically uses uh, cross validation uh to, hmm. to minimize some of that, that data of that. leakage cool. yeah uh, and then it, i don't know if you folks have used cat boost it's a competitor to xg boost it's not something i use a lot but it does uh, you know the the cat in cat boost refers to category and it does some cool things under the hood uh and it, it is really a, a target encoding mechanism that's just a variation on, on kind of what we talked about with that mean target encoding um it is Bayesian-like, uh, so uh, I probably can't speak to it eloquently here, but if you're interested, check out that article that I just pasted in the chat. Um, I, I put this other bullet in here too. This is something that I've done with categorical variables occasionally. It's, I call it like beta binomial encoding. So this is truly like Bayesian, right? Uh, where... yeah. And again, the idea is you 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 don't want to just use the you know percentage that survived for each level of a categorical variable because you could overfit. So what you do instead is say, well, if I look at my total training data set, what percentage have you know of 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 the the uh, folks have survived? You know maybe that's fifty percent. I, I can't remember what it was in, in the Titanic data set. You can fit a beta distribution to that. Right to come up with your alpha and beta parameters, and so that serves as your your prior, and then you use the actual experience for for each level uh, to kind of offset that prior. Um, so you kind of have a, a smooth version of that mean target encoding, right? So it's a blend between uh, the the percentage you see in the overall data, percentage of folks that survived, and the percentage that survived related to that particular level, um, right, uh, of of the the categorical variable. So so it's really like a conjugate prior if you're familiar with that, uh, yeah. from from Bayesian inference. Uh, I've used that in some real world projects and, and gotten some pretty good lift from that. Have you ever used uh, like a vector embedding, like uh, that you might get from like a deep learning model, like uh, like he talks about in chapter nine. Uh, not for not not for using with the tree based models, but I have seen somewhere in the literature, I can't remember where it was, but I think it's for like a graph embedding where you could this is actually something we tried and something I was doing. So I was wondering if you ever uh, tried this with the uh, random forest or tree based model, like taking the category bar variables, training a some kind of embedding layer, neural network on I guess it's good, I'm almost a form of target encoding now that I think about how you think about what it is, but it could be for some other um some other target, right? Like a transfer learning type thing, right? Um, some other yeah. labels, right? And then you use those embeddings instead as your numerical encoding, because it would be like a lot of calls. It wouldn't be like as many calls made, but it, or it could be more. But um, it'd be several columns of data, I guess, in the uh, in the in the in the uh, in the back when you turn back into tablet data again, right? You know what I'm saying? Am I making any sense? Yeah, and I, I think I, I have I have not used that in the in the wild. Uh, I'm f familiar with that approach, and I think that that tends to work well when you have 
really high cardinality, right? Right. Where I guess it would be, yeah, we, a case of really high, like maybe even like, I mean, I know I've seen it used for like image data, right? So you have image data and you find an embedding for that and you'd like have like, you know, 27 columns, you shove those into your tab, your data that represents the image. Yeah. And that seems to work, but. Yeah, I, I haven't done that. I It's on my to-do list, uh, yeah. you know, kind of use the the neural network to do those embeddings and then put it put it into like a, an XG boost type model. If and people do it on text, text data, what's that um, that embedding for text data called? Oh yeah, like word to vec. Text data. You're about yeah, word, word to, to vec. vec. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Forgot about that. So if your categories have contextual labels, you could probably use that. Well, do they take those vex and then stick them into a, a yeah, into like models. That's yeah. what I want to know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Well, Aaron said he's going to look into it and, and give a full report. Uh, <laughs> when was that going to be due? <laughs> probably not next week. <laughs> Uh, it, there's there's all kinds of right ways to encode these variables. There's something called hash encoding too. I've seen out in the wild. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, probably can't that. speak to that very well, but uh, I've seen folks use that, which tends to work well when you have really high cardinality um, with with your variables. But the the mean target encoding and and the the variance of that are can be really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. So I definitely suggest if you haven't tried using it uh, in your projects, go ahead, give it a whirl. All right, so uh, sorry for that tangent, but that I was, tend no, to go. That's, that's what we're here for, I think. Those tangents yeah. are why I'm here anyway, more than anything else. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so back to the uh, decision tree uh, from scratch. Um, where Jeremy starts is he, he looks at uh, just a bar plot, really, of uh, females and males, and says, or he notes that. Okay, females are more likely in the raw data to survive than, than males. So as a really simple, naive model, um, let's just say, let's just predict if you're a female, you survive. If you're a male, you die, right? Um, so that's really what we do here. There's 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 not really any sophisticated algorithm going on here. Um he does create this function to to split out the, the the training and validation set, by the way, without using scikit-learn. So that's pretty straightforward. And and and, and this one liner here is basically saying, yeah, if if you're if you're female, which is represented by zero, you survive. Um, and then the the mean absolute error from that is, you know, twenty one and a half percent. So it's not that bad of a, a first pass <laughs> model. Just kind of going from you know looking at the data. And uh, you know, making it a really, really simple model that way. Uh, and then he goes into the the the, the true decision tree uh, approach. And to do a split on any given variable, you need um, an impurity measure. And and so with a couple functions here, uh, really what we're doing is is calculating a weighted average standard deviation of survival um right so if you used um sex as your first split you have two new nodes right if you're you're you're, you're male or female and you want to see how homogenous you are in terms of did you survive or not so it's a, bu you know, a bunch of zeros and ones um you think of you know like bernoulli variables or binomial variables, uh, the what the, the maximum standard deviation you would have would be a 0.5, right? Uh, if, if it was like half and half, right? Your variance would be 0.25, standard deviation 0.5. So that would be pretty heterogeneous. So you'd want um, a standard deviation less than 0.5 as evidence that your, your model is actually um, figuring out relevant variables there. Uh, and, and so using this custom function, uh, we call score, you, you know, if we, we look at sex, um, splitting based on a, a value of 0.5, right? So if it's less than 0.5, that's, that's uh, female, and I guess greater than that would be male. We have this 
score, the standard deviation score of 4.41 roughly. Uh, and then if we split based on fair, uh, the, the log of fair in this case, using 2.7 arbitrarily as our, our split, um, you know, the weighted average standard deviation between those two nodes that are created is 0.47. Any questions on that? Yeah, so his weighted uh, standard deviation score, uh, impurity score, is not like one of the common ones, though, right? I mean, usually it's like the Gini score or the, what was the other one that's commonly yeah. used? That's a really good se segue because I did another sidebar. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> again, I, I tend to do this. And uh, for categorical variables, I, I think the, the default tends to be the, the, the Gini impurity. Right. And uh, he d defines it in the video. I, I didn't really do too much of a, a Google search on it, but hopefully I didn't butcher this, this too, 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 uh, uh, too bad here, but it's, he described it as if you randomly grab two samples, um, what is the probability that they come from the same category, right? So in this case, it would be, you know, survived or died. And then Gini impurity is just one minus that. Yeah. And so you, you want that impurity measure to be as low as possible. Um, and, and then another common one you see is, is entropy. Um, where you'd want to minimize entropy or you see in information gain out there, which is one minus entropy. So you'd want to maximize information gain. Um, but I found, found this, you know, analytics video. Um, they do mention variance on there, which is essentially what, what Jeremy's doing in his from scratch model. Um, one thing I've seen with, uh, you know, against entropy is that you're taking logs and apparently logs can be computationally expensive. So that's why you, you might want to use variance. It can't perspective. Um, but there are other splitting criteria out there too. Chi-square is, is one. Uh, cat boost under the hood apparently is using some sort of cosine similarity. Um, but the, 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 the Gini impurity and, and entropy are the two that I am most familiar with. Uh, usually, uh, you know, if I'm building a random forest, I, I don't usually think about it and I, I don't, I don't test the different, um, possibilities there. Although I guess I, I probably should to get a better sense for it. But, uh, yeah, I typically use defaults. Any, any strong opinions from the, from you guys, Torin or Ron? No, I just, I'd never seen yeah. this, What he, I, I wonder where he came up with the standard deviation times a number of points or whatever in the. Yeah, but then he he divides by the total point, so it is a weighted average at the end of the right. day. Right. It seems like yeah, it I mostly use the... defaults as well. Okay. Yeah. It seems like it could be related to the genie for the Bernoulli because it's like p times one minus p. There's like a one minus p squared in there somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> we can make it work. That's like a um, <laughs> or p squared minus p squared. Geometric yeah. mean, right? Yeah. The the genie. <sighs> There's like a though that piece some of the probability squared comes up in other um, names. Well, I know, yeah, like the AUC area under the curve has some interesting probabilistic interpretation as well, which is also similar to like taking two random samples. Uh, uh, there's probably some sort of connection there. With, uh, I think there is, to be honest with you. But uh, again, <laughs> I can't speak to it eloquently uh, uh, here. But um, but yeah, there's 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 a probabilistic interpretation to that as well that I think is is similar here to uh, to the Gini measure. Yeah. So in um, ecology, then I work in ecology, and they use these indices for measuring like community richness, and they have indices that are basically those same so like the genie index they call it the simpson index and then okay. entropy, they use that one as well called the um shannon index and it's basically yeah what you have there in text like 
um, if you grab two animals, are they from the same species in that community or like how diverse is yeah. the community? Yeah, I think that's, I remember, now you reminded me that I remember reading about a long time ago that gene index does come from that idea, the diversity index, it kind of is borrowed from there. It wasn't, it wasn't invented for, for this. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting, uh, Torin, you mentioned it's called the Shannon index. Yeah, the entropy and, one. Yeah. Which is, yeah, Shannon. Shannon developed the, entropy, right? Yeah. So those are, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's his baby. Yeah, Shannon's information yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah so it's all probably from physics, right? <laughs> yeah. Thing from physics. Okay. Uh, Right. So, so we were talking about splitting criteria in the, in the from scratch model, we're using st standard deviation. Um, and as a first pass, we do this one R model. And, and we talked about that last week, which is basically like a decision tree where you only split on one variable. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the, the mechanical details of the function that he creates, but basically it's finding for each variable uh, where the split should occur. So you get the, the minimum weighted average standard deviation, and then it spits back to you what the split is, what the standard deviation is. Uh, and he does that through uh, a dictionary here. And, um, and so you see, right, of all the variables you could split on, sex gives you the, the lowest uh, standard deviation. Uh, close to, to 0. 0.41 here. And so then he goes a step further and saying, okay, we know sex is the first one we should split on. Um, let's create two new data sets, one male and one female, and then do that same procedure using that custom function. You know, what, what should we split on next? And then looking at males, uh, it turns out that we should split on age next and use the age of six um, as our splitting item. And so like if you're less than the, less than or equal to the age of six, I'm assuming we would predict survive. If you're older than six, we're gonna predict uh, you know, not survived. And then for females, age is not the 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 best predictor. Turns out it's um, uh, it's class, class of the ticket here. We get a, a 0.33 standard deviation there. So if class is less than two, less than or equal to two, um, I, I'm assuming that that's, we would predict survive there. I didn't actually follow this through the whole way, but um, that this is still the, the best, the best split. Um, but this function doesn't tell you, you know, how, how you're going to predict. It's just that it's, it's uh, it, it is the optimal way to split it. Um, we'd have to look at that in, in greater detail. Um, it, and then instead of doing all this stuff from scratch, we can do a one-liner decision tree classifier from scikit-learn. And here we're just specifying no more than four nodes, a 2R model, which is what we just did. Uh, and then we can easily graph this as well. Uh, Let's see here. Can we answer that question about the, the classes? So if the class is less than 2.5, I just don't remember. <laughs> the, the, there's four and 116. Is it the four survived and the 116 no, died? No, there's 16 survived, four died. 100, okay. That's a high class women. They mostly survived. The, the, the high class women survived. The low class <laughs> women did not. Well, they're 50 50, I guess. <laughs> well, okay. Well, 50 50 here, right? Yeah, that's the low class. The lo yeah, yeah, yeah. High class, it's close to 50 50. But when it comes to adult males, you're doomed. 350 died. <laughs> if you are an adult, you're, you are doomed. Yes. I think that's adult what we, male, we've learned here. Male. Yep. All right. And uh, right. So we, it's not too hard calculating the, the Gini function here. Uh, and we can calculate that here. Uh, and, and so that's that's the change from the from scratch model versus the 
the scikit-learn is we are using Ginny as opposed to standard deviation. I, I don't know if there's an argument in there so you can switch to standard deviation or variance if you wanted to, but uh, again, I, I, as we noted, uh, Ginny tends to be probably the most common one for uh, for categorical you know, binary classification problems. Turns out that splitting on two variables didn't really um, improve our model fit. So yay, one R model. <laughs> Okay, and then we move on to the random forest model. Uh, we get a little history in the video. It was developed, I think, in the late 90s, early 2000s by Leo. Is it Bryman or Bremen? And the idea there is you create a bunch of individual decision trees. Uh, ideally, you want to have uh, unbiased models that are uncorrelated with each other. And key finding is if you average a lot of uncorrelated random errors from these unbiased models, uh, you, you know, the average of, of these errors tends, tends towards zero. So you tend to get a pr pretty good model overall. Um, and one way that you can get uncorrelated models is that you can train each separate model on a different subset of the data. So in practice, you, you just randomly sample a specific percentage of, of your, your training data um, in the 75%, but it could be something else, right? And you could tune that as well. Uh, so you could, be, yeah, be 50%, 75%. And then generally speaking, when you're building random forests, you also randomly sample the columns uh, as well. But to keep things simple in the four scratch model, we're, we're just randomly sampling from the from the, the rows as opposed to the columns. And going back to like the ranger models uh, in R, uh, one of the, the key arguments there is it's called M try. And I believe that that has to do with how many columns you're actually gonna be potentially sampling from for each split. Um, I, I might be butchering that a little bit, but it does have to do with how many columns you're looking at. Uh, and in my experience, if you want to hypertune anything in random forest, that's the, <laughs> that's the variable you might want to do some, some grid search on, um, that will give you the best bang for your buck. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming in, in, in scikit-learn, there's a, a similar, uh, variable argument there. It might not be called M try, but that's the one you want to tune above all the other ones. Um, if, if you're looking to get you know, immediate lift, that's, that's, that's the one. All right. Uh, and, and so it's just a few lines of code to create this random forest where we're building uh, a bunch of, um, a bunch of individual decision tree classifiers. Um, and we're doing that in the list comprehension. And uh, taking the average prediction uh, for a uh, hundred trees, I believe. Yeah, yeah, range a hundred. And turns out in this case, we're <laughs> getting a mean absolute error of about 0.22, which is also similar to the <laughs> decision tree, uh, single decision tree from, from earlier. But in practice, you tend to see quite a bit of lift there because the decision trees uh, tend to overfit. And uh, you're much less likely to overfit with a random forest. Uh, and then rather than building all this stuff up from scratch, you know, why not use scikit-learn? Because it's a, it's a one-liner here. And, uh, and so we, we have that here. Uh, and turns out that the scikit-learn model actually gets a better mean absolute error than our from scratch model. The reason probably is that the the scikit learn scikit learn model is sampling randomly sampling columns in addition to to rows. Um, again, this this is all stuff you can tune if you really want to, but in this case, that seems to to result in a, a better fit overall. Yeah, for the scikit learn random forest, uh, you use um, max features, which is equivalent to. M try, 
And it defaults also to the square root, just like it does in M in the in the range. Range. M try right, yeah, yeah, square root rule, as as the, kind of the heuristic there, the starting yeah. point, which tends to do pretty well overall. Uh, again, you might get some lift by tuning that, but in my experience, it's not a ton. Um, so if you just need a quick and dirty, right. that default M try that square root rule that that's implemented works pretty well. Good to know. Uh, yeah, so uh, Jeremy kind of gives you a list of things that are cool about random forests, or really it's <laughs> a lot of this stuff is machine learning models in, in general, but uh, specific to random forests is that you get something called the out of, uh, out of bag error. And the idea there is, you know, for, for each decision tree that you're fitting, you're, you're, you're not fitting it on all of the training data. It's it's just a, a portion, and so in our case it was seventy five percent. So, what's cool about that is you you can actually get something that approximates a, a validation score um, without actually setting aside that manually. Um, and so I've just kind of detailed here. Um, I think this is accuracy, by the way. I, I, there's probably a way to get me an absolute error, but I didn't I didn't screw around with it um, using the 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 uh, those observations that weren't used for each of the individual decision trees were, were achieving basically an 82% accuracy um, on something that kind of looks like a validation set. The other cool thing you can do with, with random forests and not all machine learning models is you can get an idea of how confident you are in your predictions, uh, right? Because because how, how we're doing this is, is we are just taking the the arithmetic average of all the decision trees, you know, those predictions, but you can also take the standard deviation of those predictions as well. And, you know, the, the closer that, that standard deviation is to 0 0.5, the, the, the more uncertain you're gonna be. Uh, whereas if, if you get something like a 0 0.25, that would tell you that, yeah, you're, you know, the those individual decision trees were, ended up being pretty pretty confident right or across across the board you you're, you're, you are confident because um you are seeing you know just a lot of similarity across across your individual models um so so that's a, a cool thing that I, i'd say I, I probably haven't really used in practice but i kind of want to now because that's something that really comes for free yeah i've used it not standard deviations but just um because I had a multi-class, more than two classes to predict. So we just used each proportion. Um, yeah. And then used it in like an imputation or a second stage inference. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, scrolling down, uh, feature importance is something you can generally get from most uh, most machine learning models, uh, particularly ones that are, are based on trees, right? Like we have this impurity type measure that we're, we're calculating and um, that can be used to create um, feature importance. Um, so really this takes into consideration uh, like how many times the variable was selected, you know, in the decision tree or, you know, in our case, the random forest and, you know, if you're using entropy, like what was what was the information gain, you know, from that, or what was the Gini measure associated with that? So you translate that to an importance measure, and um, it should come as no surprise here that sex was our uh, most important variable. We we don't have a lot of variables to begin with. Um, age and, and class are the the other two, um, and you could see we could we could probably, um, if we wanted a, a very parsimonious model maybe get rid of the other variables and see how that performs since at least according to this chart, you don't even really see <laughs> much, much feature importance. Um, so I created that does, a- That does harmonize with what we saw earlier with that simple tree. We, we already made very good predictions just on those three things, right? Splitting by sex and then for the yeah. male, splitting by age and for the female, splitting by class on a single tree. Really That's well. right. The, the one R model just on sex did as well as yeah. splitting on multiple variables. And then our random yeah. forest 
using all of those variables didn't really get us much. Right. Didn't That's really get us any lift. Mm -hmm. uh, other things you can do with, with those feature importance scores is you can use that to say, hey, if, if my variables don't achieve, it, 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 like just a, this is arbitrary, but a 0 0.005 importance, let's just get rid of it. Um, so that's just, just one use case uh, that we talked about. In the video, he mentions redundant features as well. And in the book, there's something with uh, cluster columns. Uh, I ran out of time, to be honest with you, and I, I didn't do a deep dive on that. Ron, I, I, I don't know. You, you read the chapter at some point. Uh, do, do you recall Honestly, any of the commentary on that? <laughs> I can't remember go what to the, if I go to the fast book for chapter nine, oh, that plot. Yeah, he. It's it's clustering. It looks like right similarity. Uh, yeah, between different. Right, it's trying to find those columns that kind of are not collinear, but you know closely related to each other. Right, I do I do vaguely remember that. That's yeah. And so is he, he's clustering on the importance. No, is that what's happening? Uh, it, they, they do. He does like a correlation between the different so variables. I'm just wondering what that object. Clusters. I forget how it works, but it involves correlation and then some kind of clustering on the correlation. <laughs> so, so he's he's not looking at the target variable at all, right? He's j literally just no. looking at how yeah. variables, uh, yeah, co-vary. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's not something that comes right out of the box with Random Forest. Uh, you'd have to do a little work there, and I, I just didn't really explore it much. Um, and one other thing I wanted to bring up, I, I have used, and I'm, I'm going to be terrible at explaining it, but it's Baruda. I, I don't know if you've heard of that term, um, but it is an algorithm for feature selection, um, and it uses Random Forest under the hood. And... It can take a, a while to, to get this thing to run if you have a large data set. But at its core, what you're doing is you're creating a bunch of shadow features, um, right? Where you're randomly perturbing uh, or shuffling the rows, if you will, um, for, for, for each, each variable. Um, so you have shadow copies of, of every variable that are randomly shuffled. And you're, you're looking to see, you know, um, through various iterations, if your actual variables achieve better performance than your shadow features. And it turns out that with a bunch of, you know, shuffling around, like you'll find cases where <laughs> some of your variables don't do better than, than randomly shuffled uh, uh, features there. And um, so this algorithm can be used to say, all right, if we, if we didn't beat, uh, you know, all of these uh, randomly shuffled variables, we're, we're going to say this is just not an important variable. So um, I, I found that's that's a way to get a really parsimonious model using Baruda. Um, I, I will say also that I, I haven't really been able to improve my models that much. Like if you're just looking at things like mean squared error or um, you know accuracy, something like that, I, I haven't found Baruda to be a, a great technique there. But um, uh, for for developing a parsimonious model, that's one to check out. Put that in the chat here. Um, yeah, I know he mentioned it in the video. Not, I don't think he said Baruda, but I think he mentioned augmenting the data. There, there's also something called permutation importance, which is similar to Baruda, and and it also involves um, randomly shuffling right variables. Um, so Baruda is similar in that regard. Um, it just explicitly in its output will tell you like keep this variable, don't keep this other one. Here's a variable that we're uncertain about. Um, and it ends up generating like Z-scores, um, like mm. you see with the normal distribution, and it uses these these Z-scores um, as, as a way of selecting variables. I, I think, right, there's kind of like p-values p, p under the hood um, and Z-scores. And um, again, uh, we could probably spend a whole hour on that, and I... I'm woefully unprepared to do that right now, but it's still just a cool, cool technique that I've I've seen out there and I've I've used a couple of times.
All right. Any any questions uh, so far? I mean, that's all I had on the the, the actual modeling. Uh, no, I just want to say thank you. I do have to leave now, though. Um, okay. But yeah, this I enjoyed our discussions, and I will um, be sure to I will be traveling the next three weeks, but I will keep tabs and okay. make sure that um, our speakers show up which I guess you're signed up to go again in two weeks. In two um, weeks. Do we have someone for next week? Yeah, John. Okay. I will uh, circle back with him because we talked in the chat before. But yeah, feel free okay. to chat with Ron a little more. Sorry, I have to leave early. <laughs> no problem. All right, we'll, we'll see you in a, yeah, see you in a couple weeks, Torin. Yeah, good discussion yeah. today. See you later. Bye. Uh, you know, just one comment about that cluster columns thing. I do remember that now looking at the book. Like, yeah, I, I kind of like just my eyes kind of glazed over that part. And not because there's anything, not because I don't think it's a good idea. It's because he doesn't really explain it very well. And then this, yeah. where is this function even defined? It's not in fast AI. It's like in the fast book only. I don't know where this came from. Yeah. Is it an earlier chapter maybe? That's what I was just looking right now while you're talking. Like, is this in an earlier chapter at some point? I don't know where it came from. Just comes out of the blue. I tried running it right on on yeah, it doesn't my work model. because you don't have the yeah it's done in there <laughs> right and so i was looking at chapter nine trying to see where that function was imported and i couldn't figure it out yeah me either i think it's in the fast book utilities okay. or something maybe? yeah okay. all right and I, did i look in there I can't remember now there's like there's a github for the book which is not the same thing as what he's importing here brother it's a totally different thing <laughs> which is very confusing because when he imports Fastbook, that's a package uh, which you can get, which is not the what's on GitHub. The Fastbook on GitHub is actually the book, and it's. But I think all those functions are in there in a utilities thing. So if you do import that, you still get them. But yeah, yeah it's a separate import. Yeah. that's right. Which is really confusing. I, I'd prefer that it was just all part of the same. Yeah, same thing. But I, I don't know. In it, right with Python, usually <laughs> less is more with importing. Yeah. For, oh, yeah. Absolutely. For us, uh, our users, it's, we tend to be really um, inefficient and just load everything all at once. Yeah. There's so here it is. Utils.py. I think it might be in here. Just post the link where I look. Yeah, it is. So it's at the very bottom of that file. And it looks like it calculates the Spearman uh, rank correlation and does some kind uh, of. Okay. Dendogram, which is a kind of cluster. Yeah, it's a, you're right. It says rank correlation. Yeah. So it's only yeah. like a six line function, <laughs> but it calls some pretty high level stuff. <laughs> yeah. And I, I would assume this is not, again, specific to random forest. You could probably do this with any no, it has nothing to do with data set. Force. Yeah. Yeah. And it, so that's why I was wondering if it probably came up earlier in the book, maybe. I don't know. Because we're, we're jumping around in this book. And we are. Yeah, what did you say? Absolutely. Removing redundant features. Let's start with cluster columns. Okay. What? <laughs> yeah. That was what my reaction was. So I'm like, okay, I can see how that kind of works. Let's move on. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we have so much we, bandwidth. Yeah, of course. Of course. Uh, we, we only have a, a couple more minutes, but, you know, like Jeremy just rattles off a bunch of tips and, and you know, some of those I, I should probably do a better job at heating, right? Which is just like start off simple. Yeah. Uh, just get a model out there. If you're building a neural network model, use a very lightweight architecture. You know, don't don't go for the home run <laughs> right away. Just go for something. Um, and, and you know, he he's kind of about psychology in in his you know his recommendations. Like, can, if you remember early on, he talks about like making learning whole and just learning the bigger picture before you go deep down or else it's like, you'll never, <laughs> never accomplish anything. If you just start bottom up, right. If you want to be a good modeler, just start modeling. And I, I think this, yeah. his I recommendations agree. are very, very consistent with that. Just, just get something out there, finish a model. And if it's a, in the context of a data science, competition you know just submit it and he, his recommendation is like submit something new every every day yeah 
uh, let's see, yet a couple other tidbits he puts out there, like with Random Forest, he's like, I rarely use more. There's usually diminishing returns there. Uh, he doesn't like auto ML. Uh, yeah. He likes to experiment on his own, which is interesting to me because fast AI in some respects is. <laughs> yeah, it is auto yeah. ML. Yeah. Right. It's like the tabular learner. You don't know what you're getting. It's, it turns out it's a neural network, but you don't know. Right. Like he's implementing some of the best practices under the hood, some of these best practice heuristics. Right. Um, so. You know, I, I just wonder, like, when when he's doing his own modeling, is is he even using his own package? Yeah, I wonder. <laughs> or he's Good he's question. just he likes you know playing around with the uh, with PyTorch uh, directly. Yeah. Um. I mean, I, I think we're gonna get there at some point in the the course as well, right? Where we're not just using the high level API. Yeah. No, I mean, to me, that this high level fast AI thing is more. I don't know, maybe it's not true, but I get the impression that it's more of a training tool, you know, to get you building things quickly and, and get some experience on the hard parts of, what are the hard parts? The hard parts are always like cleaning the data, figuring out what the what, what the models are telling you, not how they work. And so that's a good plan, I think. But in the end, I you agree. probably don't want to use it for your daily life. <laughs> I don't well, think. Well, yeah, I, I mean, he points to like academics that are using fast AI in their research uh right and okay you don't necessarily need to have a kaggle winning competition oh sorry kaggle winning model uh to be cutting edge in a particular domain right true. that's true and I, I think his point is like they've done a, a lot of work to try to get you like these good heuristics under the hood you don't have to do a lot of tweaking um you may have state-of-the-art results just with fast ai and, right. he, and he's he's showing you in, in, in a lot of cases that is the case for folks that are applying this to their fields for the first time yeah yeah all right well uh I, I guess one just one last point i want to bring up which i thought was cool this was in the uh the latter part of the video where he's talking about neural networks again he's talking about uh test time augmentation and I thought that was really neat, uh, which ties in with the random forest uh, algorithm where, so you have your test data or your validation data, right? And you're applying, like if, if you're dealing with photos, you're, you're um, distorting that the, 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 those test uh, photos multiple times, right. right? Like let's say 10, 20, 50 times, et cetera using your model to predict on each of those distorted versions of your test set and then taking the average across all of those distorted versions of your your image and that apparently at least in his example got better results um yeah, there, i had never also... ne never heard of that before and i think that's a really cool idea i hadn't heard of that particular way but i have heard of that in another context of using dropout um dropout at uh, prediction time you know, normally you drop at out prediction time. Yeah. Right. And, okay. And that's also sometimes called Bayes by dropout or something like that. There's a, like a, you get a quasi Bayesian type thing, get some prediction errors that way. And also yeah. maybe get some better, get some benefits from averaging over different predictions that way. Um, it's called Bayes by drop or dropout Bayes or something like that. That's pretty neat. Pretty neat. Just so many techniques with neural nets. Right. Uh, and it's, an engineering heavy discipline, right? So it's, you don't, you always hear that there's not always a bunch of theory <laughs> yeah, with, with what's, what's happening there, but like it's yeah. been proven empirically that, that a lot of this stuff works. That's the paper that talks about this, but it's, it's actually mentioned and it's pretty common practice now, you know, seven years later, it's common practice. <laughs> <laughs> Ron, do you want to put that in the chat? So I we do. have that. Oh, you do. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. There's the paper. Yeah. Bayesian approximation. Okay, drop out as a Bayesian approximation. But it's the same kind of idea. Uh, forget about the Bayesian part. It's just the same kind of this. This paper goes into details like how it actually is a kind of a Bayesian approximation. Yeah. But it's the same basic idea is that you kind of get this uh, prediction time um, uncertainty. Cool. That you can average over. And yeah. Maybe understand how well your predictions are doing. All right. Well, thank you for sharing. I'll definitely check that out.
All right. Very well, good. we're over time a little bit. Yeah, Thanks so for uh, bearing with me. To the, no, no, to the it's very interesting. I like the this idea of doing these little side trips is great because that's otherwise that's what we're You're bringing just, to this thing. I think otherwise yeah, just talking for about sure. It, there's kind of two things. Right? One is the main thing. Maybe is just like, hey, I didn't understand this, or what? What's he talking about here? Did you get this or that kind of thing? But this sidebar thing is actually a, a tremendous benefit to me. All right. Well, yeah. If <laughs> if you, you like so it, I there's it. probably more where that this came from. <laughs> I, I tend, tend to go down the rabbit hole a little bit. <laughs> All right. Oh, we All right. put the stop in there. <laughs>